ஸ்ட்ரீம் சொல்லும் போது நீங்க ஸ்டார்ட் பண்ணிடுங்க எஸ் சார் good evening students i hope you all done your inct exams very well so now in a stage of like a bit relaxed manner you want to analyze how you have done your questions and what is the general feeling of the students about this exam whether it is a easy exam or a moderate exam or a tough exam so i know there will be a mixed feelings like some of you will be feeling that okay i have done well but i don't know some of the questions whether it is right or wrong what is this, this is a repeat topic or this is a new topic something all the queries are these things maybe in your mind don't worry just relax have a relaxed manner so let's see about uh, what is the status of your pathology questions so it is a general opinion from the students like uh, it is a moderate paper we cannot say so easy and we cannot say so tough like as you usual these inct exam this paper also like lot of questions uh, the basic concepts like the pre and para clinical subjects are being given more importance and please believe me there are lot of questions which are coming from the repeat topics yes as i used to say in the classrooms like in our sessions face to face sessions and the online sessions i used to say like there are certain high yield topics which are very specific for inct so if you see analyze this paper all the questions from all the subjects so most of the questions are from the high yielding topics yes i accept there are some few new questions are there but is that that is very few only but most of the questions are from the high yield topics only yes as usual you can see from our workbook like from our sessions you could see like most of the questions have been repeated so the key to success is do proper revision yes we know that we know the concepts but we have to start the revision that revision only makes the perfect so without much delay we'll be going to analyze the pathology question so in a short span of time like i could collect uh, some 25 27 questions from the pathology related things so as you can see from the discussion like most of the questions actually we discussed from our workbook so i'll be putting the screenshots also so now let's go to the first session first question so this was a question like the match the following sort of the things like kras alt and jack2 and kit mutations were asked so we all know that kras it is mutation is seen in your pancreatic cancer and alt mutation alt mutation it is in the adenocarcinoma of the lung and jack2 mutations yes jack2 mutation especially in the for myeloproliferative disorders and you know polycythemia vera this jack2 mutations will be seen and c kit mutations is seen in the just gastrointestinal stromal tumor i think you will also remember c kit can also be seen in your seminoma test is also yes like as we could see from our this workbook like uh, i told this uh, table column from this list of proto oncogenes is very important every year believe me every year this inct they are asking the questions from this table column last year they were asked about this pdg of beta and all those things now they are asking about this kit mutation alt mutation and kras remember kras can be seen in both colon lung and pancreatic cancer but actually alt they have given that so only we have chosen this adenocarcinoma of the lung so this is the answer for the first question good evening all good evening all now moving on to the second question and uh, this question actually like uh, about the pattern of inheritance so like as we discussed this questions also again it is a ritual like every year every year whether in the inct or in the neat exam they are asking this pattern of inheritance either directly or indirectly yes so out of this autosomal dominant one yes you could see from our list autosomal dominant one we have discussed the different kind of diseases so autosomal dominant it is myotonic dystrophy and autosomal recessive cystic fibrosis is a autosomal recessive and your x linked recessive is duchenne muscular dystrophy your duchenne muscular dystrophy and this mitochondrial inheritance is leber hereditary optic neuropathy lhon yes so this is also a high yielding topic guys so i ask you to go through this list of the autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive x linked recessive disorders so definitely these questions are there repeating every year in the inct or in the neat exams now this question which of the following is true in sickle cell anemia what do you think 
Which of the following is true in sickle cell anemia? Yes. This is the answer for this question. Second question. So which of the following is true in sickle cell anemia? So we know that in sickle cell anemia, in the class, we have discussed about this property. Remember in our graph, we discussed about the normal uh, osmotic fragility of the normal RBC. And we have discussed in the class that hereditary spherocytosis will show that osmotic fragility is increased. Hereditary spherocytes, the spherocytes will have a spherical shape, so the osmotic fragility is increased. We also discussed that in sickle cell anemia and in thalassemia major and in iron deficiency anemia, osmotic fragility is decreased. Okay, the surface area is smooth. The osmotic fragility is decreased in case of sickle cell anemia, thalassemia major and iron deficiency anemia. Also, guys, these sickle cells, when they go into the blood vessels, especially in the narrow capillaries, they are very mechanically fragile. See, they are very mechanically fragile, so only the hemolysis occurs. Why the hemolysis occurs in sickle cell anemia? Why, the, why it's sickle cell anemia is called as a hemolytic anemia? Because RBCs are destructed, because RBCs are very fragile. Yes, sickle cell anemia, the sickle cells are mechanically, they are very fragile. Their osmotic fragility is decreased. That means they are osmotically stable, but their mechanical fragility, they are very fragile. Their mechanical fragility is increased. So, it, these sickle cells will have a high mechanical fragility. High mechanical fragility. They are easily ruptured. They can be easily emolized and they will be having a low osmotic fragility. So, osmotic fragility. They are more osmotically stable. Okay, that is the concept we have to get from this. So, the answer is high mechanical fragility and low, uh, low osmotic fragility. Then, this is the standard question. Transferring saturation is reduced in. So, the options they have given is pernicious anemia, iron deficiency anemia, hemosiderosis, and hemochromatosis. So, pernicious anemia, nothing to do with the transferring saturation, not much of altered. And out of these options, iron deficiency anemia, iron deficiency anemia will have the transferring saturation, reduced transferring saturation because iron itself is less. So definitely the transferring, that is the transferring is a transport protein for the iron. So the transferring saturation will be reduced in case of your iron deficiency anemia. So as I could see, as you could see from our workbook, like we discussed about the differential diagnosis of various causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia. And as you could see here, transferring saturation is decreased in iron deficiency anemia is decreased in iron deficiency anemia now the next question this is also a very standard question a 60 year old female with a strict vegetarian diet with a strict vegetarian diet presented with a fatigue and pallor so this tells that this female is a vegan diet vegetarianism and presenting with the signs of anemia and investigations, they will see hemoglobin 9, yes, and MCV is 110 femtoliters. So the MCV is high. So it is a case of a macrocytic anemia. Yes, so this is a macrocytic anemia. So it is a case of megaloblastic anemia. So it is a case of, it is a straightforward question, megaloblastic anemia. Yes, further in our class, you should be, from our discussions, you should be remembering that folate uh, is rich in plant food and vitamin B12 is rich in animal food. So if further the question has been asked whether it is a B12 deficiency or it is a folate deficiency. So the answer here is it is mainly the vitamin B12 deficiency. So the strict vegetarians, that is, they are lacking that vitamin B12. Strict vegetarian food can have folate, but vegetarian diet will lack this vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 is rich in animal food. So the answer here is megaloblastic anemia and it is vitamin B12 deficiency. Which of the following is the protein used in HPV vaccination? HPV vaccination. Yes, we know that E6 and E7 are the proteins in the HPV which are responsible for the oncogenesis. 
if the proteins responsible for the oncogenesis of this human papilloma viruses is E6 and E7. If you ask like the va vaccination, we use this mainly out of this L1 and L2. Mainly L1 is the protein which is used for the HPV vaccination. Yes. So much of the studies have been focusing on the usage of L1 protein of the L1 protein of the HPV used for this vaccination, used for the vaccination. Yes, you can see from a workbook discussion. What is the immunohistochemistry pattern in luminal A type of breast cancer? Yes, we know that this molecular classification of breast cancer is a high yielding topic for our INSAT and NEET exam. So remember this molecular classifications? Yes, we know that luminal type. So luminal type is ERPR positive and luminal A will be having a low proliferation rate. Luminal A will be having a low proliferation rate and luminal B will be having a high proliferation rate. Luminal A, low proliferation rate and luminal B will be having a high proliferation rate. So this luminal type will be having both ER as well as PR positive. So other options will not be fitting here. So both ER and PR will be positive in your luminal type. Luminal type. Okay, so E6, E7, if L1 is the, if luminal B is asked, then luminal B means that is actually will be having a high proliferation rate. Luminal B, if it is asked, then it is a high proliferation rate. But luminal itself will be having both ER and PR positive. So luminal will be ER, PR positive. Luminal A will be low proliferation rate and luminal B will be having a high proliferation rate. Okay. Okay. If any correction in the options, please put it in the box. Like we'll modify accordingly. So this is a, a questions are prepared based on the recall from uh, the students. So the options may be slightly different what you do encountered in your uh, exams. So if it is there, you please put it in the chat box. We'll be modifying the options. Okay. We'll be very happy to have your options from your side also. And uh, the next question is, a patient presented with history of menorrhagia and uh, there is a family history of bleeding, like father or brother, there was a family history of bleeding. And they were asking about like deficiency of which of the following factor is inherited as an autosomal dominant. So we know that hemophilia A and hemophilia B, deficiency of the factor 8 and factor 9, or both are X-linked recessive. So out of these things, it is von Willebrand factor. Deficiency of von Willebrand factor is actually the autosomal dominant condition. So the familial bleeding disorders with the autosomal dominant inheritance will be thinking of von Willebrand's disease. As you could see from our discussion in our workbook, von Willebrand disease type 1, type 2A and 2B, all these are autosomal dominant. Type 3 may be autosomal recessive, but type 1, 2A and 2B all are autosomal dominant. All are autosomal dominant. Okay. A patient was diagnosed to have gallbladder polyp on routine ultrasound. Patient is apprehensive of development of carcinoma of gallbladder. So they were asked what are all the risk factors of the gallbladder carcinoma and which is not the usually the risk among the given options. What do you think the answer is, guys? So among the given options, which one is not a, usually a risk factor of the development of gallbladder cancer? Gallstones more than three centimeters. Yes, we all know that the cholelithiasis, gallstones is a proven risk factor for the development of gallbladder carcinoma. So gallstones is definitely a risk of gallbladder carcinoma and porcelain gallbladder and your primary sclerosing cholangitis are the proven risk factor for gallbladder cancer but polyps less than 10 mm is usually not the risk of uh, the risk is very low out of the given option this polyp less than 10 mm will be having a lesser chances of developing this gallbladder carcinoma but gallstones more than three centimeter PSC that is primary sclerosis in cholangitis and porcelain gallbladder are the known risk factors for gallbladder cancer gallbladder cancer yes very good very good 
So you could see that post we have discussed post link gallbladder carries an increased risk of gallbladder cancer and also the important risk factors is uh, gallstones. Gallstones. Yes, this is our standard question. All of us know or are very familiar with this question. A patient presented with cough and fever with the signs of tuberculosis and they would have given you this image of this granuloma. Yes, granuloma with, with the collection of this epithelioid histiocytes and in the collection this Langhans giant cell. So the presence of Langhans giant cells and your granulo and your collection of epithelioid histiocytes, it is a granuloma. So we know that the main important cytokine responsible for this granuloma is interferon gamma. Yes, interferon gamma. We used to remember, no? Gamma granuloma. Yes. So please remember in case of granuloma, interferon gamma is the interferon gamma is 